So good evening, Wabash. Good evening. Yes. Thank you. Well, that didn't start great, but we, we finished strong there. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alex Delonis. I'm the director of financial aid here at the college, uh, and I have the honor to introduce the first speaker in the President's Distinguished Speaker Series, Dr. Nathan Brawl. Dr. Brawl is a professor of economics at Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota, where he has served as faculty since 1999. Dr. Brawl earned his bachelor's degree from St. Olaf College and his master's and PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. His work as a labor economist studies the connection between family background and educational and labor market outcomes. Dr. Brawl's 2018 book, Demographics and the Demand for Higher Education, absolutely fantastic, examines how recent demographic shifts likely are likely to affect the demand for higher education. In a follow-up project, the Agile College, Dr. Graw draws on interviews with higher education leaders to provide examples of how proactive institutions are grappling with demographic change. Speaking of proactive institutions, uh, Dr. Graw's research has had a direct influence on Wabash's recruitment strategies over the last few years. With new remote recruitment in Texas and Arizona, Wabash has used Dr. Graw's data and research to adapt, knowing that Indiana and the Midwest will be impacted the most by the change in demographics. Uh, so Wabash, if I could have you join me in giving a warm welcome to our speaker, Dr. Nathan Graw. were non-Hispanic whites. By 2018, that had fallen from 72 to 54%. Yeah. 
And that's still where it was in, in 2020. So as we look forward to seeing the tipping point coming, it will come in the next few years for the country. This is something that we've been experiencing, we've been adapting, and we can expect more. Now some of this change here is by race ethnicity, some is by geography. We've seen young families in particular move out of New England and on the West Coast and toward the South and the Southwest. Um, that's also been reshaping the composition of students. We see immigration sort of amplify a lot of these trends about race, ethnicity, and geographic location. Immigrants come to the country and they don't just randomly spread about the country. Minnesota, where I'm from, Indiana, not at the top of the list. Uh, eventually, immigrants make their way, but disembarkation points in New Jersey and New York and down and along the southern border are more marked by those populations, and so we're also seeing shifts in the population due to those forces. But those are kind of slow moving forces. Recently, we've noticed a more fast moving demographic change. That has to do with the number of babies being born. So, for those of you who are old enough to have been involved with Wabash back in 2008, you'll remember the financial crisis as a time of a lot of uncertainty and stress. And that's how young families experienced it as well, it seems. Um, there's high unemployment. And one of the things that seems to have been one of the adaptations that those families adopted was lower fertility rates. Well, the economy's recovered since then, and of course we had a pandemic, but fertility rates didn't. And so we saw a pretty dramatic drop in the number of babies being born. So this is CDC data from 1975 to 2021, the number of babies born each year in the country. And you can see that you know, I'm starting at what was, what was a low point. So we've got the baby boom, and then there's the birth dearth around the time that I was born. We had decades of more or less increasing numbers of babies being born. And at an 18 year lag, those of us who served traditional age college students were experiencing larger and larger cohorts of high school graduates, in essence, during this time period. We can see that there's maybe a plateau, it depends on whether you think the rise of 1990s, you know, is that just a flip, in which case you say, okay, there's kind of this long-term trend, or maybe it goes up and there's a bit of a plateau. And then we see that starting in 2008, we've begun a decline. The decline is now fairly lengthy in time. So we got all the way through 2021. This isn't something where you say, well, we're going to have a couple lean classes and we'll make it up on the tail end by admitting a few extra students. It's also relatively deep. If you look from the top in 2007 down to what is so far the local minimum in 2020, it's a 16.5% drop. We're seeing a number of babies born that we haven't seen in 40 years. Now we might imagine making up for this with immigrants. Two reasons to doubt that. One, we're not seeing significant movement in immigration reform that would be necessary in order for that to work. And second, maybe most importantly, first generation immigrants do not make up a significant part of higher education demand. They're important, I'm not saying they're not, but they're just not that numerous. And that's in part because most first-generation immigrants come a little bit too late to be relevant for a traditional age college market. So we really do significantly depend on births in this country, and we just don't have as many. We could see the challenges caused by the plateau first, and then even when she was writing in 2014, Sarah Luca is able to see just the beginning of the decline. And back in 2014, in a front page expose, uh, Sarah Lipka wrote that, you know, until a few years ago, colleges could always just anticipate the next class is bigger than what came before. But those days are over. And I think it's important to note that she's right in 2014, as colleges were in essence experiencing the plateau. We weren't, in the Northeast, they were already experiencing some decline. They participated in low fertility very, very early on. Uh, but it was still modest decline. For the most part, she's talking about stagnation in the numbers. And she's saying, okay, that's important. And I think it is important. We're seeing stress fractures in higher ed. We're, maybe we have grown up with policies developed in this period of consistent growth, and that's allowed us maybe to adopt less than best practices. We get away with a few things. That when we reach a world of just scarcity, merely stasis, not even decline, it all of a sudden becomes apparent that maybe we've been periodically, even unknowingly, saying, well, we can balance the budget by admitting just a few extra students, and there we get a little bit more energy income and problem solved. Well, that's no longer possible when you don't have increasing numbers of students looking to get into college. So I saw this data for the first time as part of a strategic planning exercise. Um, I saw WICHE data, the Western Interstate Commission for Higher Education. They forecast the number of high school graduates by state. And even in 2012, you could see kind of a gaping red hole in the map in the Northeast. In the Northeast, low fertility for a long time had led to projections of declining numbers 
of young people graduating. It's that plus health migration of young families. And for those of us in private higher education, you all are part of the Northeast, I would say. The Great Lakes and, and the New England area are, are kind of the top. But you obviously are a little bit closer to the western edge. And yet, and yet this part of the country is really uniquely important to private higher ed. The northeast part of the country contributes a disproportionate share of students to private, um, private higher ed, private four-year schools. And so even as Carleton is a little bit more westward focused than some of our peers, I was looking at that data thinking this does not look good. I mean, we've got all of these, these competitors, competitors who sometimes we don't have the greatest win-loss record when the admissions folks present at faculty meetings. And they're in this region that's shrinking. I bet they're going to come into regions where we routinely are, are fishing. And all of a sudden, things become tighter for us. And my second thought was, oh, maybe I can ignore this data. <laughs> because probably it's just a small institution, and we don't serve all college graduates. And so I started to think, is there, is there something that I could do to give me a little bit more nuanced picture of what's going on than simply the projected number of high school graduates, which after all, with the same data that was being given to two-year community colleges and then very, very selective four-year institutions. And so what I did was to use the Department of Education data I can create a little probability model. What's the probability that a person of this demographic type goes to college? And not just any college, but I can actually see which colleges they attended. And so I can differentiate not only two and four year institutions, but highly selective from less selective uh, four year institutions. So here's what happens if we project our recent past college going behaviors onto the population that we see in census data from the American community. So we have here four different projections for four different subparts of higher ed. In the upper left, we have what's projected to happen if recent college-going behavior continues for young people who have demographic markers of attending a two-year institution. In the upper right, we have the same concept, a projection of number of young people with demographic markers projected to attend a four-year institution that's not among the top 100 colleges nor among the top 100 universities. So these are typically regional in their their enrollment scope. Um, they're usually relatively open access, relatively not selective. In the two bottom panels, we have four-year institutions. These are submarkets of those in the bottom left of colleges and universities ranked 51 to 100 on US News lists of colleges and universities, and then the top 50 colleges in the top 50 universities in the bottom right. Everything is done relative to 2018 numbers. So if you see a number like 90%, that would mean 10% below what was in 2018. So as I look across these four subparts of higher ed, I see something in common, and that's the contraction in the mid-2020s. It's just an echo of the decline in birds that happened at the time of the financial crisis. But I also see something that's kind of different across the four. In the upper two panels with the less selective institutions, it seems kind of more flat and then it declines. Whereas as we move toward more selective institutions, we have sort of a, a secular upward trend and then that reverses for a time before we might hope for a recovery. So what leads to the different trends in these different subparts of higher ed? That speaks to a different compositional change. Um, the, the principal explanation is that the access agenda of American higher education has actually been very successful. The share of parents who have college diplomas has increased dramatically and will continue to do so. And parents who have bachelor's degrees are very likely to send their young people to college four-year college more specifically, and even more particularly, selective forms of four-year education. And so as we have the shared population with the college diploma expanding, it creates kind of an updraft in the numbers of young people who have demographic markers that in the recent past have been associated with attending those more selective institutions. Now I want to stress that this is a projection, not a prediction. So we're actually just saying, here are all the young people who have these demographic markers, and there's this subgroup that's growing. Whether or not the seats at those institutions will expand or not, well, that's up to the institutions. Now, I think we can understand some of the news that we read in light of that bottom right graph. So, for instance, the University of Michigan at Ann Arbor has been adding seats. When they add seats, it makes, frankly, your entire enrollment look small. So, um, you know, they're, they're a big player. But we also see that at, at Yale and, and several other um, more selective institutions, they're actually adding seats because they think strategically or because of a mission motive, there's a reason that they should be adding seats. It's got nothing to do, frankly, in those institution cases with demographics, right? It's, I mean, it's in part because I guess they've got a bigger pool, but frankly, they're, they're not governed by demographics. They're rejecting the vast majority of the students who apply. So we can understand part of that, but I kind of doubt this sector will grow quite that fast. 
when I think about what that means for an institution like Wabash, you obviously sit kind of right at the cusp of those lower two pictures in, in my analysis. I think there is going to be some spillover, because I don't think we will see expansion at the very top in numbers like we see expansion in the pool that's interested in attending those institutions. And as those students who might have otherwise, in past years, been admitted are not admitted, they're going to go somewhere. And I think you know, those institutions like Wabash sit at an interesting place where there might be some questions about how do we appeal to those young people who don't get into maybe their first best choice, but maybe we're a better match for them in any case. Now, none of us really have a national audience, so those were national projections. I don't even think Harvard recruits nationally. They're, they're regionally inflected as well. Um, you know, obviously, you all are more regionally inflected than they are, but I, I don't think anybody really has a national audience. I think it's probably necessary to think about this on at least a regional basis. So here are the same projections, now broken down by census region. And here we can see that the northeast quadrant, that's the Midwest, into the northeast of the country has been having low fertility and out migration to such a degree that even now, they're on the downward slide. And that helps make sense of the bylines that we see in the Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed that we see about mergers and closures. Disproportionately, it's happening from institutions that are a bit northeast of here. And that's because you really do see already declining uh, pool in those areas. The South and the West are, are somewhat stronger. I looked at this breaking it down by private versus public going young people. In general, those markets don't look that different. Probably in all in the same boat. Maybe the South is a little bit stronger for the private than the public market, um, but then the South doesn't send people to private colleges that often. So it's like it was the one exception, and then it was the exception that might not matter a whole lot to higher ed. But we can see definitely that there are, there are regional differences here. And so, like you all, Carlton has been thinking about, okay, how do we even more focus toward the west and toward the south? I uh, was talking to Scott a bunch. We, we moved our posse program from admitting a cohort from Chicago to admitting a cohort from Houston, trying to make a connection between Carlton and the students, and frankly, with our, with our alums in that region to try to energize the Carlton brand name in that market. Well, that's all about just looking at these numbers and recognizing that the, the market in Illinois is not really that, you know, okay, we've cornered the market in Illinois. I'm not sure we want that right now. If we look at fertility rates by state, um, yeah, so Illinois has got some health migration issues as well right now, but uh, demographers describe uh, a replacement rate of fertility, which is 2,100 babies born per 1,000 women. You need 1,000 babies to replace the women, 1,000 babies to replace matched males, and then because of uh, non fecundity, you need an infant mortality. You need a little bit more. So 2,100 babies per 1,000 women is the replacement rate. Illinois is 25% below replacement right now for children. India is 16% below replacement rate. So you know, why in the world would we want to corner a market that is right now on, on serious decline? We'd much rather, if we could, to establish a foothold in that Houston market. We can also look at the data and ask what happens to the distribution of young people here by race and ethnicity in the markets for these different subparts of higher ed? At the left two most bars, we see the projected distributions for the 18-year-old population as a whole. This is the story you've seen on the news in so many different ways. It was the, the William Frey uh, type question. We see that the share of non-Hispanic white, that the black share, is falling. It's falling below 50% during this time period. That's largely driven by an increasing share of uh, of Hispanic Americans in, in the young population. And then as we move to the right, we see the same concepts. For first, the young people with demographic markers that seem headed toward two-year school, and then the three subparts of four-year education. As I look at this graph, I think one thing that's notable is that we expect a more diverse future in each and every subset of higher education. It's not that, well, okay, the two-year colleges are going to become more diverse. By the way, the two-year colleges now have a distribution that's almost identical to the population. They, they serve a very, very representative cut of America. If you're a uh, faculty member for a long time at Carleton, it's easy to think about them as, well, they, they serve you know, maybe low-income people. No, they serve all of America. The, the income distribution in two-year colleges is really, really representative. The income distribution is weird. is the one at Carleton, right? So, um, so that's a very, very representative sample. So what happens to the population happens in the two-year and the regional four-year market for the most part. As we move over to the national elites, it's totally possible that those much smaller markets could 
move in ways that are different from the population as a whole. So for instance, if you look carefully, you'll see that those top 50 colleges and universities actually become more diverse, yes, in part because of a larger share of Hispanics in the population, but also an increasing share of Asian American students. So diversity doesn't necessarily look the same at all institution types. If you look by region, the Midwest is a, a less diverse region than, say, California. In California, it looks like the population is going to diversify more slowly than here in the Midwest. That's not a terrible shock. California's already so diverse. To get more diverse than they are right now is, is really saying something. In the Midwest, we're going to do some catch up, and we're going to become diverse at a faster rate, so that by the end of this time period, the differences between regions will, will be projected to be smaller. So, okay, in Minnesota, in Indiana, and in the surrounding states, maybe it's not as diverse as in the, in the country as a whole, but the speed of change is going to be a little bit faster if we work in those markets. Another important thing here is I, I asked the model, what if I were to dramatically reduce immigration, cut it in half? And the answer is, okay, of course that would make for a less diverse future, but it would still be true that each and every subset of higher education is going to be more diverse in the future than it is today. In other words, the diversification that we are experiencing today in higher education is baked into who we are as a people. And so yes, immigration reform can make a difference, but no matter how draconian a policy we might imagine, it's not going to stop the diversification. It could slow it down, but we are moving in this direction, and we can face a future that's going to be more diverse than we see today. So this presents some challenges for hiring. We see a shrinking pool of young people. Um, it's going to be experienced probably differently by different subsets of higher ed. And at the same time, we're seeing shifts in the composition, which frankly are moving out of what has traditionally been the groups that we've been most closely associated with, the Northeast, uh, non-Hispanic whites, all whether it be in geography or race ethnicity, we're generally seeing moves towards sub-markets that have been underrepresented in higher ed. So we've got some challenges ahead of us, and I think it really does, you know, it merits pausing and saying, well, okay, so we've got, we've got to do something different in the future if we are going to continue to thrive. But the good news is that higher ed is already responding. We do not have to look at those projections and say, well, that is our future. That's a projection. If we continue to behave the same way we have in the past, this might be our future. But why don't we think about how we might be different? As I think about these differences, I'm going to pull examples from all sorts of places. We'll look at examples from two-year schools, elite schools, open access schools. I really strongly believe there's a lot that we can learn from other institutions, even if they're not like us. But I also want to stress that obviously mission and context are really important. So if you see something that I suggest is kind of an interesting idea, it doesn't mean that I'm saying you should do this here. There are going to be things that we're not going to do at Carleton, for instance. And yet I still think there are lessons to be learned from watching other institutions adapt as they do. And I hope that it can spark conversations about, okay, well, what would it look like here? And what is it already looking like here at Wabash? So with those caveats in mind, one place we might see change is interest outside the domestic market. Now, COVID has obviously thrown a wrench into that. You can see the COVID effect here. Uh, the Institute of International Education hasn't yet reported final data, but the preliminary data suggests a rebound that still leaves us 10% short of where we were pre-pandemic in the 2021-22 year. So recovery but incomplete. I do not largely talk about that, though I think it is, it is worthy of noting that, okay, we all just learned in the last several years the international student market brings with it some additional risks that everybody except for the University of Illinois, which bought a really big insurance contract on its international student enrollments, um, didn't seem to quite see coming. But go back in time. Um, you'll see that there's a downward trend in new international student enrollments. The yellow line is for undergraduate students. And I think a lot of people will say, well, yeah, the Trump administration implemented all sorts of visa restrictions and so on that made it hard. I'm not saying the Trump administration didn't do that, but look carefully at the dates. The downturn began in the year 2016-17. Those matriculation decisions were made when everybody knew we were going to have President Obama follow, I'm sorry, President Clinton follow President Obama. Right? And yet, we still had a decline. So I, I, I raise that because I think it points to the fact that we have other challenges in the international student market. It's not that we can simply say, well, American higher ed has done wonderfully with international students, and we have. The growth there has been greater than in uh, domestic markets since World War II. So it really has been impressive growth. But it's not like you can just flip a switch and the students will come. I hear from people like the President of NACAC that when he talks internationally, parents immediately ask about gun violence and other issues about American culture that really transcend some of the questions of who's in office now. And in addition, we also see intense competitive pressure. 
the United Kingdom and Canada and Australia, and even China and India themselves, are trying to woo these students. So China and India are building institutions that look like the American model in order to retain some of these one million students that they've been sending to us. So yes, maybe we look for international student markets. Um, I think it's been wise that Wabash has participated some, but not necessarily seen that as, as some golden ticket out of domestic weakness. Because I think there are some real challenges there and you have to ask yourself, why do you think we will succeed where the industry as a whole has seen uh, some real signs of weakness? We might turn to different students within the domestic population. This example comes from Bunker Hill Community College. The different student group they are trying to pursue are adult learners. So I'm not anticipating that that will be where Wabash goes. It's certainly not anything I've heard at Carleton. But I think Pam Edner, who is the president there, makes some important points. She had seen this kind of change in the California system, where she was chief academic officer at a time when they were facing real budgetary pressures following the financial crisis. And so they went and they recruited a whole lot of non-traditional age students. And he said, we, she said, we pumped them in. I mean, if you, if you recruit, you do get a deal. But we really didn't think about how we needed to change as an institution. And so she's doing it at Bunker Hill. She's committed to, you know, in essence, doing it right. So here, she's talking about the importance of professional development for faculty and staff. And she knows how easy it is for us to fall into the mindset of, well, you know, why are the admissions folks just bringing me the right students, by which we mean the students that you brought last year? But of course, as we see an evolving population, and especially if we're going to reach out to new groups, you're going to get students who have different strengths, different weaknesses, just differences. And it's going to be a different pedagogy that's required. We're going to have to think as teachers and as educators about what these new students need. And so we need professional development to get us past kind of a maybe predictable, natural resistance and get to a new space that says, OK, what are these students bringing to the table? How can I work with that? Um, she also talked about how it was important to think about everything through this lens of the new student group. So with adult learners, she gave an example. She said, we had an orientation process where students had to be physically on campus for two days before we would accept their registration check. No, you can't give us your enrollment dollars until you've been here two days. Not maybe unreasonable when you're trying to serve 18 year olds, but if you're going after people with jobs and kids, and you say you have to physically be on campus, she said, I know the content is important. I'm not questioning that. But we needed to rethink how would this be experienced by an adult learner? So I think there's an important example as we think about reaching out to new student groups. How does this change the way I need to, to, to operate in the classroom? How does it change the way we operate the registrar's office? What do we need to do differently in the dining halls so that we can become a home for four years for this different student group? How can I tap into the strengths that these students bring? How can I identify maybe there is a, a statistical difference in their preparation? Okay, so the student needs something different than that student. Let me identify that and help them just as I would any other student. So it's, it's going to be a lot of, of thinking about what these new students bring to the table so that we can, yes, be the best college for them, but also so that I can really make use of the diverse experiences that they bring in my classroom. Some of this might mean that we have to re-envision who we are. We have to re-examine our own self-identity, and I think that's hard work. So this is an example that I'm quite sure Carl isn't going to do anytime soon. Uh, Drake College in Iowa added uh, an associate's degree program. So a four-year institution uh, says, well, maybe we're not identified as a four-year institution. We're a higher ed institution, and we offer two-year two degrees. And that was because they saw a population in Des Moines that they weren't serving. The students would apply and they'd say, no, we're not ready for our four-year programs yet. And that you do that long enough, you have to ask the question, maybe we should be able to serve you. Um, I think it's really, really laudable that Drake was willing to, in essence, think about how it might have to change so we could meet students where they are, rather than continually indicating to students, okay, here's how you have to adapt in order to be Drake ready. I think admissions folks are going to have to get an A. I do. But I don't think that's going to be enough. 16.5% decline in the number of babies being born. How high would the matriculation rate have to go to offset a 16.5 percent decline in the total number of kids? And the answer is we're going to have to increase matriculation rates by about 14 percentage points, from about 67, 68 percent up to something like 82 percent of high school graduates going on to college. Okay, I would love to think that was possible. I really don't think that's feasible. So I think we should recruit hard. I think we should expand access. Those are right things to do. They're smart things to do they're probably insufficient. We're also going to have to think about student success. If we can re-enroll students, we don't have to admit as many in the front. We'll have the same enrollments, but we'll be serving students more effectively. 
not that bone itself. And we'll be getting repeat customers. So this can look like a lot of things. University of Southern Maine in 2014 laid off a bunch of staff and faculty. Painful. Because they didn't have the budget. So they brought in a new remote manager who said, look, we know a lot about retention. We know, for instance, that face-to-face -face advising is really, really important to do right. So every student had a 90-minute advising meeting before they got to campus. They identified a lot of students who needed disability services before classes began, rather than what they've been doing in the past, which was waiting until that first midterm, the student blows up the exam, now we've got a real problem, somebody identifies, hey, there's a learning disability here, let's get you an accommodation. And so they were able to increase their retention rate by 8 percentage points in just a few years, and all of a sudden they had budget surpluses that they could talk about. So advising. Uh, St. Cloud State, in the upper left, is from my home state. They've been uh, putting together a survey. It's a 10-question, multiple-choice survey. And they give it in the third week students are on campus. They're identifying students who have a B average or better in the fall, but have a 20% attrition rate even in the spring term because of low sense of social belonging. And so as I hear some of the conversations you all are having about the roles of fraternities and how do we make, how do we make fraternities speak in new ways to new students, the new Wabash student? How can this be something that draws students in as we know that it can? I see a lot of similarity there, right? The importance of social belonging. We have a ton of research on the importance of that in retention. In Rutgers, uh, they're playing around with uh, their student work program. So they're training up student work supervisors to be mentors. So that when they, they supervise students, they also do a, a weekly pulse check, just kind of check in with the student, where you're at, try to identify students who have needs for academic support, get them connected to services. Um, I think that's kind of an inventive way of taking something that we view as typically you know, just something that financial aid has to do as part of college, you're going to do your student work, and saying, hey, let's make this a leverageable opportunity to connect students to campus. At Wheaton College, Massachusetts, um, they just put a bounty on the first year retention rate. So this is trying to address the ownership issue. We're not going to make much success with retention if retention ultimately belongs to the enrollment management office. Each one of us, whether we're a custodian in the dorm, or we're a librarian, or even a faculty member, can have an impact on a student's life. Right? My, my uh, college roommate connects with the, the dorm custodian. When we go back for a reunion, he seeks her out. He would spend lunch with her downstairs in the, in the storage room. They'd watch soaps. Um, <laughs> Kevin Trash's background, I'm not surprised. That was the adult who he connected with. But the point was, she was just a custodian in the dorm. But she made a connection. We all have opportunities to make that connection with students that draw them in to re-enroll. So can we all take ownership of this issue? Probably we're going to have to think about academic programming. Uh, this is Wheaton College in Illinois. The Equitas program is a series of cohort-based programs. It's sort of like an honors college within a college that doesn't want to admit it has honors colleges. I'm guessing you all probably would have that challenge too. No, the whole thing's an honors college. Um, but they, they have to apply to get in. They get some project money. Um, they're going to have a cohort element that's uh, an entry course and some projects along the way. We know cohorts increase retention rates. In this case, they're doing an urban leadership program that speaks to the location relative to Chicago. It also probably speaks to some students and underrepresented groups. So it's kind of interesting to see how they're doing some academic programming that's largely repackaging existing courses, a little bit of additional investment on top. We also see institutions investing in the connection between life after college and what goes on on campus. We know students say that they're more likely to experience their cost of education as worth it if they see that connection. So in Endicott College in the upper left, this looks like a signature co-op program or internships. That's a heavy footprint. At Lewis University, it's computer science plus X degrees. So computer science and anthropology, computer science and music, helping students have marketable skills when they get the job market. But I want to stress, you know, life after college doesn't have to be about STEM or business. At Scripps, it's a humanities clinic. Um, they got that term from Harvey Mudd, which is obviously from a science context. But the idea is they tell the humanities students, it's a capstone experience, we want them to think about uh, real world problems like environmental degradation and come up with uniquely humanistic solutions. I think it's a great way of prompting students to understand and to see how all of those courses that they've taken actually do prepare them for what comes after. I suspect those script students are going to be much better at articulating to potential employers. Why should you pick me, this strange liberal arts student who took some history classes and some economics classes and some science classes? Why should you pick me over the person who has sort of this pre-professional approach? So however we do it, I think there's, there's value there. 
All the examples I've shown here um, are resting on individual institutions acting alone. I was going to put in a slide about collaboration, and then I took it out. Then, in talking to Scott, just one thing that I saw that you all are doing that speaks to the, also the possibility of collaboration is your ROTC collaboration with Purdue. We know that students are drawn into various affinity groups, whether it's the football team, or it's a particular major, or it's the ROTC. But we can't always pull things off. There are certain things that struggle with scale. Okay? Well, it's going to have to be a time, I think, where we get used to the idea that on Monday, I'm competing with another institution tooth and nail. And on Tuesday, we sit down and we talk about how we're going to work together to accomplish something more. I think it's interesting to think about how the COVID experience might intersect with that. Um, the virtual opportunities might open up uh, partners beyond our geographic limitations. So in Carlton, we've played around with sharing faculty and teaching courses with St. Olaf because they're a mile and a half away. There are some good things with that, but there are also some challenges with that. And I think it's interesting to ponder, um, while we're not going to be an online education school, could we share faculty with Davidson or Wabash or Pomona or all of the above to create programs where some of the classes are in person and maybe some of them are hybrid in order to create new programs that we are unable to do otherwise. I think there's some interesting collaboration responses as well. So I promised a metaphor that was better than the apocalypse. And so this uh, is thanks to Ned Bennett over at EAB, who in a blog post pointed to Tweed's book, Anti-Fragile. And in Anti-Fragile, he's writing about the responses of systems to stress. Many of us often think about two responses to stress. The first one is fragility. We break when we recognize that's not good. And so we often run to resilience or robustness. Like a turtle just pulling into his shell, I might hope that the stress is just going to pass over me. And maybe I can come up the other side unchanged. And admittedly, sometimes robustness is, is not a bad outcome. Maybe that's all you can hope for. But there's a third possibility that's actually more optimistic, and that's anti-fragility. The anti-fragile system gets stronger when put under stress. So I, I really hate running. I did jog around your campus because I've got high cholesterol and some other issues that my doctor tells me I should work out. So I do it. But my runner's high is when I stop. <laughs> now, I see I've got some injuries. I hear about this other endorphin thing. I don't know. I'm not wired that way. So why do I do it? Well, I do it because I'm putting myself under stress in the hopes that I'll come off the other side stronger. And so when I think about higher education, I look forward to your 200th anniversary in a few years, or maybe a little bit beyond. I'm not honestly hoping that you all will look back and say, well, the last 15 years were a good ride. I think it's going to be a little bumpy. I think it's going to be a little challenging. There might be some difficult choices to make. But I hope you and we can say, well, look, we've expanded access. We've made clear the relevance of Wabash education to what comes after life at college. We have maybe addressed issues in financial aid and so on to make this affordable. We've improved student success and retention. We've revamped some curriculum to make them more connected to our students' lives. And so was it an easy run? Well, maybe not. But was it worth it? Was it worth it because now we have put the institution on a foundation that will serve it well for the next 20 years? And so the, the anti-fragility framework is the one that I prefer to think about, and I hope that um, you all will join me, and frankly, I, I think I already see it here at Wabash. So I'm going to stop there and open the floor for questions and conversation, and I look forward to the, the comments.